So, you know, if we think about it, there's sort of widespread agreement. You look in like, say, the aftermath of, of last week's uh, Facebook whistleblower, um, you know, one of the major themes that comes out of that is how little we know about these companies that, you know, what we what we know basically about how social media censorship work tends to come from these big leaks of information. Um, and if you kind of step back, there's sort of widespread agreement that it's not tractable the way things are now. Like we need something needs to change. The question is what? And I think with social media, one of the challenges is, you know, every day we hear about things getting taken down. Um, but, you know, take a simple example. Earlier this year, Twitter started deleting any tweet that mentioned the word Memphis in it. Uh, and, you know, so all of a sudden all these tweets are coming down, being told they violated Twitter's uh, terms of service. And then, of course, the company obviously says, oops, sorry, it was an AI algorithm, you know, run amok. We're sorry. Uh, well, how exactly did that AI algorithm, you know, come to see Memphis as being a bad term? We have no idea. How did these things get added? Was that a human being who typed in a keyword? Was that some machine learning algorithm that looks for things going viral and makes its own decisions? These are all these challenges that, you know, is it human moderation that's the problem? Is it machine moderation that is the problem? We really don't know who's being affected by these policies, what's being affected, um, you know, what's being removed, and, and specifically how that, especially as more and more of a democracy is playing out through social platforms. I mean, it's where our government officials, you think about social media today. It's where our government officials, you know, they talk to us. Yes, they have their own websites. Yes, they have other ways of getting things out there. But social media is how they talk to the constituents. To what degree is social media um, ensuring that certain content, for example, doesn't go viral? Maybe one congressperson puts out a new proposal and maybe social media platforms uh, don't allow that to go viral. Um, another person puts out something and they push that out there to make that really go viral. To what degree are these silent hands sort of shaping our democratic debates? These are all these things that we really, really need answers to. No, I, I mean, some really great questions that, that you're raising here. I mean, there's a kind of illiberal ideology that has sort of, you know, entered our common space, and especially especially in Silicon Valley amidst uh, uh, social media companies, this critical social justice ideology, which demands ki that basically only its perspective is the valid one. Anything that isn't its perspective is hurtful and harmful. So this is, you know, I imagine a number of viewers are thinking to themselves, well, I know what the problem is. This is the problem, what I what I just described, for example, right? But this you're saying that's actually there's there's some deeper questions to be asked here. Yeah, you know, it, it's fascinating. Uh, you know, I, I love history and, and you know, anytime that I'm trying to understand, you know, a, a question, I like to look back at how do we get where we are today? You know, it, you know, we think about social media content moderation today. We, we think of this, you know, we think of content moderation, you think of the Internet, you think of these big social platforms. Uh, but, you know, these are, if you, if you step back, these are the same questions of freedom of speech that our, question, our nation has wrestled with since it's fine. For more than two centuries, what is acceptable speech? Should you be allowed to criticize your government? Um, if, you, if you are allowed to, does that change during wartime? Should you not be allowed to criticize your government? For over two centuries, we've tried to wrestle with this question of what is harmful to talk about? What is allowable and what is harmful? And if you look back through our history, our country has tried it every possible way. You know, we've tried it where the federal government tries to, you know, come up with rules about what's allowed and not allowed. We try it with the states, with the cities, with private companies, with this, with that. We tried it every possible scenario. And none of those has worked to the point that we said, wow, this is great. We have a solution that works. And, you know, I think it was Justice Harlan that, that um, you know, famously said the question of what is how to define acceptable and not acceptable speech is, quote, an intractable problem. As a society, we've thrown up our hands. We've said, you know what, it's it's impossible to figure out what's allowable, what's not allowable in a country that's really diverse with a large, you know, with wildly different lived experiences and beliefs and so on and so forth. It's impossible for us all to come together and say, yes, these are the following things that are allowed. These are the following things that are not allowed. And anytime you have that situation where there's this rich diversity of viewpoint, um, you're never going to come to that consensus. So what we've said is, look, we can't figure this out. Let these private companies in Silicon Valley sort it out for us. And, you know, that's really at the end of the day what the challenge, what the problem is, is these companies, you know, they're operating. If you kind of flip the coin and look at it from the company standpoint, uh, how do they decide what's allowable or not allowable? The courts haven't been, you know, other than a few exceptions, the courts in the U.S. haven't really deemed much, uh, you know, disallowable. Um, and so there's not really much guideline. They're sort of making it up as they go. And that's the real problem is we didn't stop and say, hey, you know, social media companies, you can you can remove what you deem to be harmful. But 
Um, you know, that's the part that's missing. We could have said, but you have to put these out uh, to a vote of the public. Um, you know, we didn't say that. We, we could have said, well, Congress has to review these at regular intervals and we have to publish these rules in Congress way. We didn't do that. We just said, look, these private companies can do what they want. And most interestingly, um, if you look back in the history of censorship in the United States, um, there was a period where states had a lot of, there was a lot of sort of local control of censorship. Um, Section 230 specifically says the states have no ability to, uh, you know, to alter these rules to local, um, you know, local needs. So I think that, that's that really the, the, the root of all of this is the fact that we gave up as a society and told these private companies to figure it out in themselves. And we're not happy with the result, um, but that's because at the end of the day, you're never going to have you know, a set of private companies that are going to be able to come up with rules for all of us. We need this transparency to really be able to understand like, what are these rules? And I, I come back to, if we look back a couple years ago, The Guardian had a leak of internal content moderation guidelines. This is called the, the original Facebook files, they called it. And what was fascinating about that is, you know, for a long time, people said, look, the social media companies are censoring, but, you know, they have to. They have to censor to help society, get rid of all that horrible stuff. Um, but then when that came out, we saw that, you know, oh, well, look, anti-Semitism, that's allowed. Um, you know, violence against women, that's allowed. All these different categories were explicitly with labels saying allowed under certain circumstances. And that provoked this huge discussion about, well, wait a second, why should these things be allowed? So society all of a sudden was able to realize that, you know what, all is not well here, that maybe we do need to have a little bit more uh, visible. So I think that's the thing is once you have, once you understand what's happening, then we can have these societies discussions about, um, you know, do we agree with these or not? Well, and so we definitely need to talk about Section 230. It's obviously kind of, you know, pretty central to these questions. Um, the thing is that I think we, it didn't occur to most, most people that this was even an issue, basically until around 2015, 2016, when there was also, you know, social media uh, companies started getting a lot of pressure to censor, including from Congress and so forth. And then, you know, people started noticing, oh, you know, my feed is getting throttled. It seems like, I don't know for sure, but it looks like, oh, um, there's, uh, looks like, you know, this, this person got taken down. This is the canary in the coal mine now. We can expect more people to be. And it just, there, it sort of seemed to accelerate dramatically from that time, basically from, from the time of the Trump candidacy and the beginnings of the Trump presidency. Yeah, you know, it, it's fascinating. I mean, if you, if you walk back um, and look at this, really these questions, since the dawn of the internet, you know, I mean, the internet is an aphorist term, you know, it refers to a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of history. But if we kind of look at the early period, like the Usenet era, for those that are old enough to remember the, the Usenet, um, you know, these same questions materialized there. So, you know, there was this old term called the flame war, you know, attacking people online, doxing, publishing people's information. And what's interesting is you look at these early days, there was a lot of public discussion about what should be allowable. Um, you know, should you, if you're angry at someone, should you be allowed to publish their personal information on the web and tell people, you know, publish their phone number, tell people, call them, go to their house. Um, you know, what today we would call doxing, uh, you know, that was around, you know, way back when. Uh, you know, we talk about like modern Moderation. Even in the earliest days, you know, in Usenet, um, you know, you had this issue. Take any issue, like alt.politics.middle East. That was a really particularly contentious board. So you had kind of this, this, you know, essentially what today we might think of as kind of as like a mailing list. Um, but you know, again, like that got to be to a point where there, there was a moderated version of it. Um, and you know, for any given topic, you'd have kind of this, this, um, you know, this sort of, um, you know, this Usenet group, but then you'd have other versions of it. You'd have moderated groups. Some cases you even had nice, quote unquote, nice versions where the rules were no profanity, no attacks, no nothing. Um, and that's also, if you kind of look at that early era, that's how they kind of dealt with a lot of this issue of, we all have different ideas about what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. So in the Usenet era, if you, you know, if you didn't like the rules in one group, you, found, you create another group. You could create as many of these, you know, sort of groups as you wanted. The problem today with Twitter and Facebook and these social platforms is they're single universes. You know, take Twitter. If you want to have, say, a private debate in the corner about something, the problem is that debate, everyone in the world sees it. Everyone in the world's weighing in on it. So something that happens in one corner of the world, the entire world has to weigh in on it now. 
Um, in Usenet, you could kind of, you know, you could create these different communities that each had their own rules. And that's partially where, you know, today it's not just the US, it's the fact that, you know, there's a conversation here. Someone on the other side of the world can participate in that conversation. And they may have a very, very different perspective on, you know, what is, um, you know, their, you know, what they see as acceptable and not acceptable. And so it's kind of this fact that social media, it sort of, it shoves us all in this, this, this single box. It, essentially, it shoves everyone in a giant soccer stadium, gives them all a microphone. It'd be, it'd be like if you took the Republican National Convention and the Democratic National Convention, and you had them in the same ballroom, you know, together with each other. In real life, we say, hey, that's a really bad idea. Nobody would think of doing that. On Twitter, that's exactly what is happening. All this political raging debate. Um, and, you know, again, don't forget those algorithms that sit behind the scenes that quietly prioritize what we see. And, you know, that's a really important thing that, you know, those algorithms, they look at what fires us up. You know, you notice on social media, you don't normally see, you know, just endless screens of puppies and, you know, unicorns and happiness. What you see, because again, like if you, if you scroll through and you see, hey, a little puppy there, you might quickly watch the video, but that's it. You're not going to engage with it. If you see something, it's like, oh, that fires me up. You're going to go, you know, you're going to start commenting. You're going to forward that to people. You're going to start commenting on it. It's really going to fire you up. And that's what in turn engages people. And so inadvertently, if you just take a simple algorithm and say, give people what they seem to react to, you're going to immediately shovel people towards things that, you know, kind of fire us up underneath. And, and again, these are things where we don't have visibility. How are those algorithms working? I personally, you know, I prefer chronological where you get everything in chronological order because that way, at least, you know, you're seeing it as it's being produced. It's not some algorithm, you know, trying to figure out what makes you tick and give you the stuff that's going to, you know, fire you up. Um, and this is, becomes important too, is as you know, more and more of our offline stuff gets organized on social media. You know, think about today. If you're going to, you know, organize a protest on the street, you don't send flyers out or send emails out or even pick up the phone. Usually, you post it on social media. So, you know, which of those are, you know, which of those are going viral? Which of those are not going viral? Is that because you know people aren't interested in your topic, or is that because some algorithm is intervening? And so, last year you saw um, with the co with the reopening uh, protests in the early days of COVID. You know, Facebook put out this official policy that said any physical protest that's in violation of uh, local ordinances around COVID, we will not allow that protest, um, you know, to be advertised on our platform. And we'll pull that down. Same thing if it doesn't explicitly require masks or there's anything else there. Um, and then you had the George Floyd protests and they quietly removed that restriction. Um, and so this becomes very interesting that, again, that wasn't a public thing. That wasn't something where they made an announcement and said, we believe that, you know, these protests are important. So we are withdrawing uh, this restriction. Um, and, you know, so that's the real challenge there, that these these rules changes happen every day. Um, and we just, you know, we, we know we don't know what the rules are. I mean, how can you have a society where, you know, a digital society where you don't even know what the rules are? And as a journalist, you know, I routinely will ask the companies, I'll say, um, well, you know, based on this rule that you've published, would this particular statement violate your rules? And the answer I always get 100% of the time is, we can't comment on hypotheticals. Post it, and if we ban you, it wasn't allowed. That's not a, you can't have a digital world like that.